Hi, this is your host Sapnil Bharti and welcome to another episode of T3M or Topic of this month. And topic of this month is Infrastructure as Code. And today we have with us once again, Rob Hirschfeld, CEO of REC. And Rob, it's great to have you on the show. Swap, I'm excited to be here for one of my favorite topics. Exactly. When I was working on this series, you know, the your name popped up first. I like, hey, okay, maybe this actually a series is to fully dedicated to you <laughs> and Rack. And we have talked about infrastructure as code so many times, um, and you know, we have some lengthy discussions about it. Um, talk a bit about how do you look at uh, infrastructure as code. How do you use it, and is it different from how others use it? I do think we treat infrastructure as code, and this is a racket phenomena, but it, it also comes back to my conversations in the industry. We look at infrastructure as code as much more of a process-focused uh, thought instead of tools. So our idea is that the operations team wants to be more like a development team in that how they approach management and automation of their infrastructure. So a dev test prod, high degrees of reuse, right? A lot of modularity, stop inventing custom stuff all the time, have high reuse, strong APIs. Um, you know, those are the things to me that really drive um, infrastructure as code processes and practices, not... Um, where sort of a lot of people get stuck, which is, can I describe my infrastructure in YAML and then submit it, you know, in, and then store it and get I, that to me is so low on the hierarchy of infrastructure as code. It's almost laughable. Uh, before I was talking to you, I was recording a show and uh, the, the theme that they gave was that has DevOps kind of lost its luster. Uh, uh, so when we look at infrastructure as code, uh, once again, talk a bit about some of the, as you said, it's practices, processes. What does it mean from these cultural uh, movements? What does it mean for DevOps? And, you know, what DevOps teams can do to, once again, look at things uh, more like code? It's interesting because DevOps is also a very process statement, but it's very focused on collaboration as the core piece for what Dev makes DevOps DevOps in my mind. It really is this idea um, that the team should be working together, this introduction of the concept of a pipeline of going from a developer into production. And, and to me, a lot of what we've evolved to from a DevOps perspective is this idea of pipelines. One of the things RackN really promotes is this concept of an infrastructure pipeline. It's a very similar concept, but connecting together all of the pieces and parts that are necessary to run your infrastructure. And this is one of the things that people often uh forget when they're dealing with infrastructure. Infrastructure is not one thing. It's actually a connected series of different components, different services, different capabilities. For an enterprise, uh, especially on premises, you know, bringing systems online and operating them is usually 10 to 15 different systems that all have to be orchestrated to make that work. And that's where the pipeline comes in. If you're using cloud, you know, people use Terraform. They, If you looked inside your Terraform plan, the Terraform plan is actually a mini orchestration that's connecting together all of the cloud services for you. And people overlook the fact that, that there really are a lot of moving parts that have to be connected together. So this idea of pipelining all of the services is very compatible with what DevOps looks at from connecting together or pipelining together different teams and making them work together. Um, they're, they're incredibly compatible uh, components, uh, sort of different conceptually, I think, just because there's a discipline involved in infrastructure as code that DevOps teams welcome, but it's a different thought process. And uh, I, when I was listening to you, I also remember the whole series that we did on in, in first year as code. And there was a whole episode dedicated to just collaboration. And once again, you mentioned collaboration a couple of times. Uh, talk about the importance of collaboration and why do you focus so heavily on collaboration? It's one of the things that sort of the formation story for RackN that was, was the reason why we started the company is because when we were doing operations work and bringing automation into customer environments when we were, when we were forming it inside of a team at Dell, what we kept finding was is that we would bring in automation and then the automation would end up unique at each customer. And so as we improve things, we couldn't help each customer uh, improve. We couldn't share things back. We couldn't work within our teams. And when 
as rack end, one of the things that we find when we work with customers today is that each team is an automation silo and they have trouble sharing automation between their teams, even if they're doing very similar things with very similar infrastructure. So I look at the amount of waste and frustration, time, toil, right? All these, all these complexity, all these problems that we have in our, in our day-to-day lives as operators and on the infrastructure side that are exacerbated by the idea that we're not collaborating. We're not reusing each other's work. We're not able to take advantage of you know, the great automation of the team sitting next to me or the company sitting next to me um, in a way that allows us to benefit from, from that shared work. And that is a significant problem, right? I have a strong history in open source. And when in open source, we, we, we try to solve problems together. And it has always been frustrating to me that operations teams have a lot of trouble or before rack end had a lot of trouble actually sharing and reusing code. And that's been a big focus for us as sort of the formation story for rack end is addressing that collaboration story you know, at the automation level. When we you know, uh, talk about automation, uh, we can uh, talk about the big elephant in the loop these days, which is um, generative AI, you know, Gen AI, LLMs. Uh, Talk about uh, its role. Is it going to help or hurt? This is one of those alarm bells that I've been been trying to sound for people is that, you know, we see people get very excited about uh, LLMs and using code generation techniques. And it works actually very well. I've, I've done some talking about this and shown some demos. The, the challenge is that if you're not careful, it's very easy to have the LLM generate a really significant amount of technical debt, meaning code that is generated for one use that isn't maintained by a person, is not designed to be maintained by a person, is you know, you're not able to then reuse that. So if you're using LLMs to repeat inf- you know, code that you are, might already have, you might generate it very quickly and you might say, I, I didn't want to reuse code that I already had. I was able to generate new code and it's great and new automation and that's great. The challenge is that everything that people build automation and code wise has a life and has a life cycle to it. So unless you're using LLM for truly throwaway scripts, you're potentially walking into cases where it would have been a better investment. And we're working to make LLMs help do this to find examples of scripts that already exist where you can say, oh, wait a second, somebody is 90 percent, 95 percent of the way there. And I can use the LLM to help me understand, interpret, extend and add to the, the code, the automation that I already have, and then collaborate with the people who own that original code. So now you have one piece of code servicing both people. Uh, it is definitely a danger that we're walk, we're running towards, I wouldn't even say walking, we're running towards this idea that we're going to have more and more bespoke automation. Uh, we did a roundtable recently where we, we heard from financial um, operators in the financial services area And one of the things that stunned me was they were like, it's not that we don't have enough automation. We actually have too much automation. Um, And so if we turn around and have LMs magnify that effect and create even more, uh, we we really run the risk of just this explosion of unmaintainable infrastructure. And I think most people already feel like they have more, more automation than they know how to maintain and more infrastructure than they can track. So we're going to have to use LLMs a lot more carefully to solve that problem, um, or we're just going to race to race to the bottom fast. Can you also talk about uh, what kind of trends you are seeing in the context of IAC in the ecosystem? IAC is definitely very well entrenched. One of the challenges that we see um, from a trend perspective is that people keep working in silos here. They take something like a Terraform, um, and then they wrap Terraform in an orchestrator, and then have to then bolt in Ansible or some other automation configuration or bash scripts or things into that that system. And so what we we see is we see a lot of really interesting tools that get people very excited, um, often centered on Terraform, which is is a a HashiCorp open source project. And so what we've seen here is that there's a lot of enthusiasm for solving these in siloed, siloed dimensions, and they add a lot of value doing that. What the challenge is is that we're not seeing the collaboration on the other side. So as people start looking at these tools and taking advantage of of this infrastructure, they really need to be aware of how do we reuse this this, this technology. It's very common for me to talk to a platform team at an enterprise 
that has thousands and thousands of Terraform scripts and are trying to figure out how to consolidate that work. That's the purpose of the platform team and sort of the, the growth of platform teams, which is another trend line that I see. But that the platform teams themselves are a response to this sprawl, automation sprawl that, that we've been creating. And so we have to be careful um, not to take control away from people, but definitely to encourage you know, a reduction in the sprawl because ultimately that's, you know, it just becomes a challenge and a security issue, a compliance issue, a governance problem when you have a lot of duplicated automation running around. And so that, that's been something that we're tracking and we're, we're seeing, you know, as much as there were, people were enthusiastic about all these tools, they're starting to scratch their head on the governance side of it. And, and can you also talk about what role is rack and playing in, once again, helping organizations, you know, kind of embrace these practices, uh, these processes? I appreciate the question. We, we took an infrastructure as code approach in architecture, even before it was uh, called infrastructure as code. Um, uh, we've had several names for it and in, in the past. And at the very foundation, when we built the system, and I, I think this is important for thinking how this works, infrastructure is code thinking, right? The ability to have immutable artifacts, Git processes, dev test prod, right? Share and reuse components. So the, the composable modularity of the way we, have, we build automation is designed in from the very start. Uh, and that has been a critical piece to how we build uh, Digital Rebar, our product, and make it so that when people build automation, they're able to leverage the existing infrastructure pipelines that we have in place, the processes, the methodologies, the ability to have a very concrete dev process so that when you go into production, every all of your automation is immutable and locked down. I, I, I focus on that a lot because it ends up creating a really significant value in ROI because nobody wants variation and change or uncontrolled code in their production environments. And so, you know, being able to have these infrastructures code processes, you know, some Git ops and, you know, know exactly what's deployed in which places and have ways to manage that and describe it and, and collect the information those are actually the underpinnings of infrastructure as code, those process controls and gates and really empowering people. And I can tell you that the ROI that the teams who adopt these practices, right, through digital rebar or through their own process, the ROIs are really significant. Their operators are much more productive. Their infrastructure is more reliable. It's more robust. Um, they're able to create compliance reports and actually tell people what they're doing. They can respond to security issues much more quickly. They actually can rebuild their whole infrastructure from scratch in an hour or two. Um, these are game-changing um, impacts in how people manage and run infrastructure. Um, and they're very real. We see we see customers, you know, uh, people don't think financial institutions are particularly high achieving IT organizations. They're wrong. They, they're, they're remarkable IT. Um, uh, they spend a lot and they invest a lot and they do a lot of work with uh, in, in IT. Um, but we've seen just dramatic turnarounds on, on how quickly uh, organizations can get things done and how reliably and, and, and how much, especially in highly regulated organizations, how how much they can be confident that they know what's going on and they can quickly respond to issues. Rob, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about, uh, as you said, you know, our favorite topics. Thanks for all those insights. And as usual, I would love to chat with you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Swap. I'm a pre I appreciate the time and I'm looking forward to our next conversation.